Good morning, Kansas City. This is Steve Stites. I'm the Chief Medical Officer, Executive Vice President of Clinical Affairs here at the University of Kansas Health System. And we're back with our daily coronavirus briefing. On my ride is Dana Hawkinson, Hawkeye. Uh, Dana Hawkinson is the Medical Director of Infectious Disease. And on my left is our Vice President of System Integration, Chris Wilson. Chris is really in charge of helping us put together our rural health network. And there was a really good question yesterday, and we wanted to follow up a little bit about what's going on in rural America. So I wanted to start out, first of all, just letting you know today, or as of last night, we had 37 positive patients with COVID-19 here at the University of Kansas Hospital, and we had 14 of those patients were on ventilators. So our numbers being about the same last couple of days, maybe that's a good sign, too early to tell, but we're hopeful. But um, first, let me just turn to Dr. Hawkinson. Dana, uh, anything this morning, uh, special news, breaking news, anything, anything cool? Yeah, I, I think that we are starting to finally get to see um, randomized controlled trials, very well um, done studies looking at therapeutics for COVID-19. Um, Plaquenil, that's hydroxychloroquine, that's been a popular one um, that we've been looking at that's been uh, popularized in the media. Uh, we are we are looking at it here. We have criteria trials here at the health system, um, but also a, a large um, trial from from China. So we're looking hopefully to see get more data and really see if it's if it's helping or not. Yeah, and there are so many trials and so much research going on across the country and across the world. Um, one of the, the good outcomes, even as we have to uh, distance and shut down travel, is the amount of collaboration going on internationally around trying to find therapies and new treatments and new ways of approaching uh, this novel coronavirus. But Chris, I, I think that this is going to have a significant impact on rural communities. They're a little behind the, where we are in terms of, the, of, of getting the rapid rise, but we do believe it's gonna go there. How is rural Kansas looking at this? What is your sense of what's going on out there? Yeah, well, I think, uh, Dr. Stites, one of the first things I'd say is we're always committed to improving the health of the state of Kansas, and we've been focused on that pre-COVID. And now during the COVID response, uh, that, that need and that desire for us to do that has just escalated even more. It's just we're talking about different things right now, so we're talking about how to respond to, to COVID. And, and what we've seen, I you know you and Dr. Hawkins have been part of webinars the last couple of weeks. We've, we've broken two webinar systems because there's such a desire for information and, and a hunger for uh, updated information that we can put out across the state. Uh, and what we're, what I'm really pleased by is we can have a conversation in the morning between folks like yourselves uh, and folks in Wuhan province or in New York, and by the afternoon we're able to share best practices from critical care teams across uh, across the world, really, and, and what our rural providers are looking for and helping us uh, get the best information and best practices out there. Um, I think from a from an incident standpoint, you know, about half the counties in Kansas right now are in the Kansas City metro area between Johnson and Wyandotte County. Um, maybe across the state, we haven't seen as much of that that curve hit many of the rural communities. But what concerns me is you do have a couple hot spots out there. So, where you've got instances of uh, maybe 15 to 25 per 100,000 in the Kansas City metro area. Uh, there's a county in Kansas that has an instance of 192 per 100,000, uh, where you have, say, a nursing home outbreak where um, you have a very concentrated uh, spread of the disease that could put a real strain on on the rural health infrastructure that might be in that community. Yeah, that that's kind of a that's that's especially a concern when it does get into nursing homes because we know, Dana, that once in nursing homes the disease can really accelerate through yeah. a, through a community that um, is especially vulnerable. Yep, absolutely, absolutely. Um, you know, we know we've seen this. This started in Seattle. We know that close knit communities and centers are um, very susceptible to having the, the disease and the infection go through various members and a lot of members of that community. And of course that leads us to what our message is every day, stay at home, stay safe, socially distance, it really, really does work. There are some maps that were published in the New York Times today we're looking at the relationship between social distancing and rate of rise. It is undeniable that those, na those areas that have practiced distancing are seeing a slowdown in their rate of rise. So I do think, I mean, the evidence is so compelling that that has to be our continuing ongoing story as, as, as healthcare leaders that we need folks to practice. And, 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 and it, you know, it's what we were saying the other day in, 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 in that, that famous uh, um, Wizard of Oz line, there's no place like home. Well, we're open for questions. Anything that folks out there are wanting to ask? 
This is Angie with KCTV5. Are you guys looking at sharing ventilators among hospitals if that need arises? Can you talk a little bit about the conversations taking place? We have, um, and those conversations are ongoing, and the answer to that is yes. I mean, if, they, if, if let's say for whatever reason we didn't have ventilators and another hospital had an overwhelming number or we didn't have the need for those and another hospital had an overwhelming number, then we would do whatever it took to help make sure we kept, keep people safe. Um, the other thing is that most hospitals have looked at saying, gosh, what if push came to shove, would we even consider sharing ventilators between two, three, or four patients? That's met with a lot of mixed reviews. There's, a lot of, there's just a lot of uh, physiological struggles with that. Um, I think everybody has that idea in the back of their mind somewhere buried in their closet, but um, it's not something we want to do because there are a lot, of, a lot of struggles, so I would say we'll try and not do that, but I think everybody would go and share ventilators first. What we hope is that with social distancing, staying safe at home, when you're out at the park, maintain your six feet, nothing, you know, okay, I'm a physician, here it comes out, nothing bugs me more, no pun intended, um, nothing bugs me more than to go out and, and, and drive around one of the parks and seeing people congregated together or walking together or acting like it's another normal day. This is not a normal day. This is, this is a pandemic and that, that changes everything. And so trying to keep people safe is what we, we need to do in order to lessen the impact of this crisis and quite possibly shorten the duration of the crisis. Because um, we, we don't know, I mean, you know, we, we talked about this the other day. If we can make sure that that R not value gets down to one, that's when these things start to disappear. And so what's R not? R not is how many people one person infects. So if one person infects three or four people, we're spreading the disease pretty rapidly. If it gets down to around two, it's harder, and you get down to around one, and that's when most of these things begin to die yeah. out, Dana. That's when the epidemic stops. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. So yes, we'll share ventilators between hospitals. We've been, we're hoping the supply chain continues to, to ramp up. We are seeing some areas that that's beginning to occur, and um, we're hoping there'll be more ventilators out there for supplies. And um, uh, and but and the thing that people can do uh, most of all is to help us shape the curve. And it's what we said yesterday, if you wanna, if you wanna shape your future, shape the curve. Questions? Hi there, it's Jessica with 41 News. Um, I know you mentioned that this thing dies down when the R not becomes one. My question is, because I believe on a last call, one of you had said when a virus is new, uh, it doesn't really know what to do with people. Does the virus, um, does the strength of the virus lessen when that happens, or is it just going to be this as severe of an illness even down the line? Dana? Yeah, that's a very good question. Uh, that, that question takes into account infectious diseases, immunology. Again, we're always asked the question, if I get the infection, can I get it again? We've seen some reports of people possibly being able to shed the virus or maybe be infected again out of China. Um, we don't know all the details or the data from that. We hope that certainly in the short term, um, for three months or maybe six months, you will certainly have immunity. We know that the first SARS, you're able to have antibodies for two or three years, and then after that, the antibodies decline in your body. Um, but we don't know exactly what that means for infection-wise, and are you going to have symptoms? If you have symptoms, are they going to be less? Those are questions we still don't know at this point. We would hope that once your body has seen it, um, you are, in fact, immune. That was the initial uh, thoughts by the CDC and Dr. Fauci. And we hope that's true, um, but we still, have to, we still have to look for that and get that data. So, Next question. Playing off of that a little, so just I'm one of those people who, you know, like the rest of us, we're, we're here, we're in the thick of this, and yeah, it's a bummer right now, but you look forward to the future. Are people, you know, in the next year, say, who are, you know, immunocompromised or things of that nature, are they still going to have to be, I guess, just as cautious? How long does this really go on if you want to avoid, you know, do you need to have those protocols in place so that you avoid getting it? I think that's yours, but I have a follow-up to it because I want to spin off this, so go ahead. Okay. Um, yeah, I, I mean, at this point in time, 
uh, we really haven't seen uh, an end point. You know, everything is being pushed out longer. Um, the stay-at-home orders are being pushed out longer. Um, the, the shelter in place. And until we get some more information on really what the virus is going to do here in America, as far as um, dying down or being not as prevalent as it is now, we really can't answer that question. I think for the, for the short term, the next three to six months, absolutely, I think those precautions need to be taken by not only immunocompromised people, but, but everybody. And that's hand washing. Um, you know, probably no, obviously there's probably gonna be no social or mass gatherings for a little while, but for, certainly for the short term future, I, I would assume and would hope that, uh, especially immune compromised people would be taking extra precautions, yeah. And I think that, you know, I have a clinic, I said before, full of cystic fibrosis and some quite a few uh, lung transplant patients that, that we follow up with. Um, we're telling those folks to stay home. And when it comes to the question, how, how long do we do that for? You know, once the virus begins to die out, your chances of contacting it drop. And that's when we'll start saying, okay, let's loosen things up a little bit. But what we have to practice is uh, a little Harry Potter-esque. It's constant vigilance. Um, because what, what, you, what you want to do is as, if you start to see it rise, then you got to try doing the distancing thing again. But we know that influenza is seasonal. We know that by and large coronavirus is seasonal. So our thought is this will probably be a little like that. And as we build up more immunity, and then once we get an immunization to it, yeah. then I think it's going to be safer and safer. But there's a really important lesson here. You know, you can shape this curve. You, you can shape this curve. Distancing is part of it. But the other really important part is washing your hands and not touching your face. And the good news is that's going to help you with influenza, rhinovirus, metanumavirus, and any other whatchamacallit virus that may be out there. Because they all have the same way of going. And so that so if you want to make sure you don't get whatchamacallit virus, then the thing you need to do is follow the same basic principles of infection control. They really do work. They're boring. You're tired of saying it. We try to find a new way to say it every single day so it sounds a little entertaining. But the reality is it is what works. So if you want to shape the curve, you've got to shape your behavior. Next question. You don't want what you call it virus. It's bad. I have a question about uh, droplets that may be a really stupid question, but I was talking about, this is Taylor at 41, I uh, was talking about somebody, uh, this was somebody this morning in our newsroom, and we were talking about masks and whether or not to wear them, that kind of thing, and again, uh, Dr. Hawkins, we appreciate your time this morning talking about that, um, but I didn't know, and I don't know if I've ever heard someplace along the way, if the way I'm potentially transmitting or, or sending out those droplets, is it only when I cough? Is it when I talk? Um, is it any time I open my mouth that's a, that's a potential? How am, I, how am I potentially spreading uh, anything that I may or may not be carrying? Okay, I'll take this one. Man, I, I'm going to mess with this question this just a little bit. I want to say, well, how loud do you talk? Right. And are you yelling? And, and, and you know, do you, are you like I talk you, very loud. I have a big mouth, so right. I probably spread it everywhere. No, so listen, how much you spread and, and how far you spread is dr directly related to the force of projection you have. Uh, coughing is actually enormously powerful because the way we do that is you take a really deep breath and, and you don't, you know, your lungs aren't a muscle, right? So the lungs don't force air out because it's a muscle. They force air out because they're meant to be smaller, not bigger. So you have to, your, your muscles work to open up your lung and then elastic recoil closes it. But you help that force of it when you close the back of your throat off and that's how you build up the force around the cough and that allows you to exhale or cough out a bunch of phlegm all at once. And that's where you spread it the furthest. But generally you don't spread it that far because most droplets tend to be pretty big. Now there are some people that say, oh you can dry, you can cough it in the air, you can hang in the air and all that stuff. Yeah, but the amount of that is really small that the amount is really caught up in bigger droplets, and bigger droplets tend to travel a few feet and fall flat on the ground. Really, it's about three to six feet. 
and that's with a cough. So a routine breath goes out much less, and you don't have the same volume because you're not coughing out mucus. So you'll get a little bit out there, but not like a big cough. And if you put it into your elbow, you know we tell you all the time, <clears throat> like that, into your elbow, because what happens then is all the stuff goes into your elbow. Then after your clothes are a little saturated with, you know, which we'll call it virus, but, but at, before that, it's really, if it gets lodged in your clothing, gets lodged in the nook of your elbow, then you're really a lot safer. Now, you've seen some stuff out there that the CDC is contemplating suggesting that people wear masks when they go out in the public. And the reason is that if you do that, you may decrease the amount of virus you transmit or you, if you're you know, at a table or somewhere and you cough and it doesn't leak out as much, it gets caught in the mask and drops there on, the, on, on there. The problem is that that science is a little soft on, 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 on medical grade masks, it's not soft, but on homemade masks, it's a little soft. And, then we're a little worried that if you go to take off the mask or reposition it and you don't know how to do that and you touch the mask, the mask is loaded with virus and then you touch the countertop, you may have spread more like that than if you had just coughed. And so yep. un unclear which they're, where they're going to land on that. Yeah, day. I would agree. And I think, you know, the CDC, the stance they're taking right now, um, the thoughts that they're having, I think it's still consistent with what we've said all along um, here at the health system and what the CDC has said. If you're ill, certainly wear a mask. That will help. Uh, from infecting others. If you're not ill, you don't really need to wear a mask because it's not providing you any protection, especially probably some of these homemade masks. But what their concern is is that some people can certainly spread the disease if they're asymptomatic um, and they don't know they have the infection yet. And so that is the main crux of possibly why we want to go to most everybody wearing the mask because you could still possibly have coughs. You know, certainly it's allergy season as well, and so people are coughing from that. They can certainly have allergies and have COVID as well. So I think their stance is continuing to be consistent. They're just looking at other avenues to really stop the spread. Next question. Uh oh, you're not, you're not asking something. That gives me the chance to turn to Chris Wilson and say, Chris, <laughs> what's the biggest question you're hearing out in rural Kansas? And what, what's their biggest concern? Yeah, supplies is probably the, the mm -hmm. thing that's on most uh, health care providers' uh, minds in rural Kansas. So uh, we, we hold a daily call every day with our system, and we, we go through a list of uh, topics like you know patient updates, uh, and supplies is right there at the top. And so certainly personal protective equipment, ventilators to the question earlier. We do a, an inventory every day of all the ventilators that we have across our health system, all the anesthesia machines we have across our health system, how many are in use, uh, just so we can make sure and understand sort of what the, the universe of supplies are out there right now. That's certainly one. Um, I, th I think a, another big question is the application of protocols in the rural setting. And so we get a lot of questions about um, does this PPE uh, rule apply differently in a setting that we might have that might not be in an urban setting but rather in a, in a rural environment like a critical access hospital or a rural health clinic. Uh, and so then we, we have to uh, collaborate with our uh, expertise here uh, in Kansas City and across our system just to make sure that we're applying those uh, uh, rules uh, in an appropriate way in a rural setting. We have great resource with Dr. Bob Mosier, former secretary of uh, Kansas Department of Health and Environment, who's uh, leading a lot of our efforts of helping make that translation to the rural setting. Uh, and then, you know, an another uh, question that we get uh, quite a bit is just what's it like? I think there's, the, because the cases haven't occurred yet in many of our rural communities, they haven't some, uh, but in many of our rural communities they haven't occurred yet, um, I, I think they just want to know what's the experience like. They, they really do want to hear from folks on the front line who are taking care of these patients, uh, asking very specific clinical questions that folks like Dr. Stites and Dr. Hawkinson are, are able to answer about, you know, wh when is uh, innovation appropriate? How do we do handle transfers? Uh, wh what's, what's this process going to be like for family members as they get moved from one facility the other. So uh, we'd certainly hear a lot about that. And then the other big topic is uh, a little more daunting, and, and it pre existed COVID, and, and, and that's sustainability of rural providers in the first place. So prior to COVID, three quarters of the hospitals in Kansas were operating at a, at a negative margin. Uh, and so they were already, uh, many hospitals were already in a, in a precarious financial situation. And so COVID is only going to exacerbate that situation yeah, as they do right. things like cancel elective surgeries and, and reduce the uh, in person clinic volume. Uh, and we, we really need to uh, encourage our, our state and, and federal elected officials to make sure not forget about our rural providers in that respect, that, that rural sustainability is going to be a big piece of, of how we recover from uh, the, the COVID response for our, our rural providers. And um, 
you know, maybe the final kind of silver lining that I see out there is virtual health. I, I was just going to say you've got to talk about our mm -hmm. telemedicine thing because I think this is really the untold story of a silver lining in there, mm -hmm. uh, especially for rural because we're opening up our telehealth network across Kansas, trying to have our providers are, are ready to see patients from without throughout the state, whether you're part of the health system or not. So. Yeah, absolutely. So I like to think of it as high tech, high touch. So yeah. uh, maybe before uh, maybe before coronavirus, it was um, there were some providers that were interested in telehealth, some were providing it. I, I think we're seeing uh, what we thought was going to be a two year change to telehealth occur. Uh, in a matter of two, two weeks, weeks. Yeah. Uh, and, and that, that transition has, has been rapid, it's been significant, and I, I think it's going to be to the benefit of a, a lot of our uh, citizens across the state, uh, in particular because, uh, you know, maybe historically they didn't have access to some of these specialties, uh, that now that we have the infrastructure and the processes set up to deliver uh, access to a lot of specialties and subspecialties, uh, are going to be able to have access access to that service closer to home and, and, and get the services they needed even before the COVID response was in place. And just to say, you know, uh, the government, I know is all, every, every level of government is trying to figure out how they respond to this. One of the good responses has been the loosening of the regulations around telehealth that allowed us to do stuff. Mm -hmm. So in, uh, in tradition of the great Aretha Franklin song, Who's Zooming Who, <laughs> um, uh, you know, we're all on Zoom and we're or, or what's one of the platforms you can use with telehealth. And so you're Zoom with your patient and at the meantime you're putting stuff into the EMR it's pretty slick and 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 I think it is going to revolutionize care in rural America which, uh, and I think it's like that's actually a great thing and I know we are as I said we are we've rolled that out throughout our health system we're doing it beyond and so really a strong platform let folks be part of the University of Kansas health system whether they're close to one of our out, one of our hospitals or not yeah I, I think that's right and if I you know we get asked a lot um, what's one of the what, what can we do to help from a, a lot of our patients and citizens one of the things Things I would recommend to be to try a telehealth visit, um, yeah. to be to be open to that type of visit, and, and I think you'll be pleasantly surprised. My uh, my 70 plus year old father is looking forward to his first telehealth visit later this month, and uh, he's pretty excited about it. And and I think uh, most people will be uh, really encouraged by what they uh, what they receive from a service standpoint as a result. Yeah, my 87 year old mother in law has been out showing other folks how to how to zoom, so that, <laughs> that's pretty cool. All right, other questions. What types of things since you're talking about oh, telehealth? Go oh, go ahead. You are. Oh, thanks. <laughs> thanks, Jess. This is talked for. Um, good morning, everyone. I had a question about people in recovery or people who have recovered. More and more people are recovering. They're going back into the population. Do we believe that maybe they are still capable of spreading this virus, or are they getting false information that, hey, you've had it, you're fine, you can start going back to your regular life? You bet. Let's take that How on. are we dealing with people? Well, and I just want to say we discharged three patients yesterday who had recovered here, so I just want to say that. That's good news. We do want to talk about how this this, this virus isn't so magical that it can do every, anything it wants, and I'm going to finish with that in a little bit, but we did discharge three patients yesterday, and we did get somebody off the ventilator, so that's awesome. Yeah, Dana. that's a good question. So as far as discharging, um, certainly there are different methods and different strategies which the state health departments use or the CDC gives guidance for as to when you can go back um, to quote unquote your regular life, when you don't have to self-isolate at home anymore. Those are based on uh, testing, so you can either test, um, you need to have two tests within 24, or just 24 hours apart that are negative. Um, or there's a symptom-based strategy in which you've had symptoms for a prolonged period of time after your symptoms are resolved, then you could possibly go back. I would encourage anyone to really contact their state or their local health department to see which guidance is preferred. The second part of that question, however, is are you still shedding virus? That is a very real concern. There has been numerous studies which show people can shed virus for up to 21, 28, and even outliers, even longer than that, 35 plus days. However, we're really not certain that you can, um, how infective you are at that point. I know that's a big if and, and a big concern, but we also know you shed other cough and cold viruses, such as influenza and other cough and cold viruses for prolonged periods of time, or you can. So that is still one question which we are um, working with. Um, and again, I think we're still looking for guidance from the CDC, but also if you are well enough or if you've had symptoms and if you've gone home from the hospital or if you've just stayed home with your illness, I would encourage you to contact your local health department for further guidance on that. And for us, from our standpoint with our employees who are positive, yeah. how long do we wait here in the health system before we say you can come back to work? Yeah, at this point in time, uh, we are typically now waiting 14 days uh, from symptom onset and then we are allowing you to come back to work 
uh, with provided you're wearing a face mask during that time as well. And we, we kind of like a negative test out there sometimes. So sometimes, yeah, yep, we're able to do the patient. that. Okay. So yeah, that's one time where masks are probably uh, helpful mm -hmm. a little bit, just yep. to give a little bit more reassurance to a patient and, and to the community in which they live. And so. that is from guidance from other uh, major centers who are seeing infections as well. Yep. So we're taking yep, guidance yep. from that. They're ahead of us on the curve. Good question. Next question. I heard another telehealth Going back question. to the telehealth yep, yep. a little bit, um, because I was give, offered that opportunity and I thought, well, this should probably be looked at in person. What types of things shouldn't you do telehealth calls for? Oh, what, a, when would you need to go question. into? Question. That's a great question. So I think, um, for example, if you broke your arm, obviously that's probably not going to be a great telehealth visit. Um, so there, <laughs> there, are, there are things you know, that are more surgical in nature. Um, I think that's really one of the most important parts. And then if there are other things that are going to be critical in a, in a physical exam that you, you can't tell just by seeing. So if you've detected a new, let's say a new breast lump, uh, that's a little harder to do by telehealth. If you've had a, um, a new, you know, a lump in your groin, or you feel like your 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 abdomen is really sore or tender, mm -hmm. those things are harder to do by telehealth. There's ways we can get to it, but really, those are probably the the, the things that are are most concerning. And um, and I think the key is to talk to your physician's office and say, here's my symptom. Can I go ahead and do a telehealth visit with yeah. that? They may start with the telehealth as a screening visit and then make a decision on what to go from there. And clearly, if you're acutely ill and you think, gosh, I gotta go to the emergency room, it's probably better to just go ahead and go to the emergency room like that. Mm -hmm. Any other guidance for our team? Yeah, I think that's spot on, Dr. Stites. Yeah. Yeah. I think the physical exam for certain um, conditions and complaints is, is vitally important. Obviously, talk with your, your primary doctor and, and they should be able to steer you in the right direction versus telehealth versus coming in. I think yeah. right now in the, in, the, in the response that we're in, I think um, doing the telehealth visit could help give you direction on yep. where you might need to yep. otherwise go and I help make preparations right. for if you do physically need to go to some place. Um, it allows that place to make the appropriate preparations before you would come in. And around COVID-19 specifically, I think a lot of it can be done through telehealth. If you start to feel more short of breath and it's getting a lot worse, then you got to go to the emergency room. But um, otherwise, you can check in with your physician. We have a we have a, uh, a COVID nineteen follow up clinic that we're running uh, through telehealth, and I think that works pretty well. So, I think we have time for one or two more questions before we close out. Anyone else out there? I'll go again. This is Melissa with forty one. One of the uh, one of our viewers asked a question on Facebook. Um, I know we talked about masks, but what about gloves? Uh, should the public be using gloves or and wearing gloves out in public when they have to run to the grocery store, or is that actually you know, going to make things worse? Yeah, great question, Dana. <laughs> um, I, w I would agree with you. The same thing as with masks. The ultimate thing we want to do with any of these interventions, whether it's gloves or masks, is continue to maintain good hand hygiene and not putting your hands in your face. If you have masks on, if you have gloves, you may feel a false sense of security. And so even with gloves, you could be touching things, either um, winter gloves or driving gloves, or some people are even out in public wearing latex gloves. If you're still touching things and touching your face, everything that you're touching is just getting caked onto those gloves. And so you're still putting them into your face. So certainly, if, if you want to wear gloves out of an abundance of caution, um, I'm not going to tell you that it's wrong or you can't do that, but just understand that when you do that, you are still getting debris and, and microorganisms, whether it's the virus or other bacteria, on your gloves. And if you're touching your face and putting um, the hands there, you're still going to be able to contaminate yourself. So. And then you got to still take off the glove. So just make sure glove. you wash your hands after yep. you take off the gloves because there's a good chance those gloves are going to have whatever your hands would have had on them. And gloves don't really have natural defense, right? They're just a barrier. Your hands actually have some natural defense uh, yep, set up in how your skin works. Forward, yep. So next question, last question. I thought I heard somebody else for a moment ago. Otherwise, I'll ask a question. <laughs> Chris, one of the things I think that's true out in rural Kansas that we hear a lot about is what happens if I'm a critical access hospital and maybe my average census is two or three patients and I have somebody who goes on a ventilator. We don't do ventilators in those small hospitals. What do they do? Yeah, I think they need to uh, consult a critical care team that uh, might be able to provide them some advice on how to transfer that patient yeah. to an appropriate setting. Um, if they don't need the ventilator, many of the symptoms of COVID, is, as you know, Dr. Stites, can be managed in, in a lot of these exactly. facilities. Yeah. Uh, but if they do get to that 
point in the critical care uh, continuum where ventilation is required, that's when there needs to be a, a, con a consultative visit with a, a critical care team and a transfer considered. Okay. Final thoughts, guys. Yeah, um, you know, I can't allow you to be the only one with the pop culture reference. <laughs> oh, jeez, here I go. <laughs> I mean, I you brought in the great Aretha Potter. Franklin. <laughs> I did, but that was pretty good. I, I and Harry Potter, Potter today. Yeah, two Harry one Potter. Two okay. ones, yeah. Um, but as I was flipping through the, the channels yesterday after we got home from a late day in many meetings, um, the Terminator was on. Oh, boy, here we go. <laughs> so we all know the Terminator, and we are trying to get out how to best represent our. Uh, our voice and, and our guidance on what to do and how to stay healthy. Well, if, if everybody's ever seen The Terminator, listen and understand that The Terminator, i.e. the virus, is out there. It can't be bargained with, it can't be reasoned with, it has no remorse, it has no pity. It is in the large cities, it is in the rural communities, it can infect everyone and it won't stop. It won't stop until there's no more people to infect. And so the best way to allow it to not infect anyone else is to social distance and physical distance and stay at home. Chris. Uh, just because rule is smaller doesn't mean it's easier with respect to the virus. Uh, they're just a little bit different challenges that we face, but stay at home and social distance still equally applies uh, in the rural setting as it does uh, in the urban setting. Uh, and we need our, our rural citizens and, and the rural providers need, need that as well to be able to respond to this virus the best we can. So um, I'm going to play off your pop, your, 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 your pop cultural <laughs> reference. Um, you can be the Terminator too. You can be the Terminator too. This virus has somehow been given superpowers, but it doesn't have superpowers. It's mean. It can take your life. But it doesn't have superpowers. It can't jump tall buildings. It can't fly through the air in measurable distances. And it isn't made of steel. It's a virus. And so all the basics still work. So you can shape the curve and you can keep yourself and your family and our world safe by being the terminator. And the way you terminate this infection is the same thing we've been saying. Wash your hands. Don't touch your face cough into your elbow, keep your distance, shelter at home. There is no place like home. Thanks for your attention today. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank you.